the night. Leave me all to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me Well, good morning and welcome and happy Palm Sunday to you. We have just a few seconds left and as we get ready for worship this morning, I want to give you a, a short orientation to the service because it's Palm Sunday and the worship service is a little bit different today. Uh, you'll notice that there is some liturgy in the service that we do not normally have. There is also a very long proclamation of the Passion Story, which I'm very excited to read to you later in the service today. But I want you to know that as we begin this service, there's an opportunity for some liturgy, and that is traditional to the Palm Sunday service. We will then, during the first hymn, the singing of the first hymn, I'll invite you to stand up and come forward and place your palm branches at the foot of the communion table. So just lay them right there. And then if you would, go back to your seats by going down the outer aisles, just like we do on communion Sunday. Now, while I've got you here and you're a captive audience, I hope that you've seen that we brought some dirt back in to the new ministry site. So we dug the, the big hole, we dug the dirt out, then we brought dirt back in to fill it back in, and it reminded me a lot of being in the army, of digging a hole just so you could fill it back in again. I was right at home for a week there. And then inside the church, we've gotten some painting done. There's still more to do out there. The coffee bar is in progress, and so you're going to see some changes coming still. Over the course of the next few weeks, we've got a great group of people working on getting that coffee bar set up, and we're very excited about that coming as well. So keep your eyes peeled. There are more changes coming. This week is Holy Week, and because of that, there will be an unprecedented number of opportunities for you to worship and reflect throughout the week. On Wednesday evening, we'll have Vespers, as usual, here in the church. On Thursday evening and Friday evening, we will have special services. Thursday evening will be our Maundy Thursday service of Holy Communion. We'll have that right here in the sanctuary. And then on Friday evening, we'll celebrate a service of Tenebrae, but it is a special service of Tenebrae that will be led by our choir. This is something a little bit different that we have not done before, and we're very excited about it. I think it will be an incredibly meaningful service, so I hope you'll be able to be here Friday night as well. And then on Saturday, the doors of the church will be closed. We do that um, to reflect on the period of time between when Christ entered the grave and when Christ was resurrected again. And then on Easter Sunday morning, we will have a sunrise service outside at 6.30 in the morning. We will have a breakfast immediately after that. Then our 8.15 traditional Easter service. Between services, we will have a reception for confirmands down in the youth space. We would love for you to go down and support them We'd also love for you to come down to the reception if you haven't seen that space since it was remodeled. And then at 1045, we'll have our Easter Heritage service. So it'll be a full Sunday, it'll be a good Sunday, and it'll be a great week. We hope to see you there. I want to invite you to take the next few moments to prepare your heart and your mind and your spirit to be in an attitude of worship. Praise be to God. Blessed, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who has visited and redeemed the people. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hear from the gospel according to how our Lord Jesus entered Jerusalem. After Jesus said this, he continued on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As Jesus came to Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he gave two disciples a task. He said, go into the village over there. When you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying it? Just say, its master needs it. Those who had been sent found it exactly as he said. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, its master needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their clothes on the colt, and lifted Jesus onto it. As Jesus rode along, 
they spread their clothes on the road. As Jesus approached the road leading down from the Mount of Olives, the whole throng of his disciples began rejoicing. They praised God with a loud voice because of all the mighty things they had seen. They said, Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, scold your disciples. Tell them to stop. But he said, I tell you, if they were silent, the stones would shout. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna Hosanna in the the highest. highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna Hosanna in in the the highest. highest. Hosanna, the Hosanna, the little children sing. Through pillar, court, and temple, the love, the anthem ring. To Jesus, who had blessed them, was folded to his breast. The children sing. The simplest and the best From olive head they followed Mid an exultant crowd A victor palm branch waving And chanting clear and loud The Lord of earth and heaven Almighty God, on this day your Son, Jesus Christ, entered the holy city of Jerusalem and was proclaimed King by those who spread their garments and palm branches along his way. Let those branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our Lord and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. In his name we pray. Amen. Lord, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning from the book of Isaiah in the 50th chapter. The Lord gave me an educated tongue to know how to respond to the weary with a word that will awaken them in the morning. God awakens my ear in the morning to listen, as educated people do. The Lord God opened my ear. I didn't rebel. I didn't turn my back. Instead, I gave my body to attackers and my cheeks to beard pluckers. I didn't hide my face from insults and spitting. The Lord God will help me, and therefore I haven't been insulted. Therefore, I set my face like flint and knew I wouldn't be ashamed. The one who will declare me innocent is near. Who will argue with me? Let us stand up together. Who will bring judgment against me? Let him approach me. Look, the Lord God will help me. Who will condemn me? Look, they will wear out like clothing and the moth will eat them.
kiddos come on up here and join me just come right on up here you can come up these stairs over here if you want there's a lot of room so come on up well good morning how are we doing good so today is a special Sunday what is today called Today is Palm Sunday, and on Palm Sunday, we celebrate something really special, and it comes right before the next Sunday, which is Easter. Next week is Easter, so we're very excited about that. We're like, do you have good Easter plans? Are you looking forward to Easter? Did you get to do some Easter egg hunting? Was that fun? Okay, or maybe you've got some that's, that's going to come up. All right, well, I want to tell you a story today about something that happens between Palm Sunday and and Easter. So on Palm Sunday, we celebrate the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, right? Jesus was on the back of a colt and was riding into Jerusalem, and people were cheering, and they were shouting, and they were putting their clothes on the ground and waving palm branches because they were so happy that Jesus was there. But what happened just a few days later? Do you know? Yes, the Passover meal came up, and then Jesus was arrested, and Jesus was put on trial. And some of the very same people who had been waving palm branches, and they were so excited that Jesus came, some of the very same people wanted him to be crucified. And so, this week we're going to talk about that. And on Easter Sunday, we're going to talk about the resurrection, which is after Jesus was crucified and they came out to the empty tomb. Jesus was not there because Jesus had been risen from the dead. And I'm going to talk about all of that next week. But there's something that happens in between there that's really powerful. So the night that Jesus was arrested, some soldiers came to take him away while he was in a garden praying. Some of his disciples were there and the soldiers came and they arrested Jesus and took Jesus away. And some of the disciples scattered because they were so afraid because they didn't want to be arrested. Would you want to be arrested? No. I had this one time during vacation Bible school. Maybe you were there when um, Grant Brooks, who's a police officer, and he's here this morning, he was showing everybody his police car and what it was like to be in there. Do you remember that? And he put me in handcuffs. Yeah. I want you to know this is the only time I've ever been in handcuffs. But it was not a great experience, and I don't want to go through it again, so I wouldn't want to be arrested. Did you want to be arrested? Yeah. 
No. So they ran away. They went all kinds of different places. Well, Peter was kind, he was one of the disciples, and he was kind of following along where Jesus was. <clears throat> but he was outside of the trial where Jesus was being, um, where Jesus had been placed on trial. People were accusing him of doing things. And so Peter is out there, and he's scared, and he's, he's warming his hands by the fire. And somebody looks at him and says, hey, weren't you with that Jesus guy? And Peter is so afraid of being arrested. What does he say? He says, no. Now, was that true? Did Peter know Jesus? So did Peter lie. Peter lied because Peter was afraid, right? Well, then somebody else is out there. It's a small group of people, and so they know everybody, right? Like, you know most of the people in the church, or you've seen them, and they know who you are. It's kind of the same thing. They knew everybody. So somebody walked up to Peter and said, no, I think I'm pretty sure that you were with Jesus and that you knew him. And Peter said, no, I don't know who it is. And he starts getting more agitated, so he lied twice. Now, before any of this starts, Peter and Jesus are talking. And Jesus says, there's going to come a time where I'm going to go somewhere, and you're not going to be able to come with me. Don't worry, I'll come back and get you. And Peter says, Lord, I would go anywhere with you. And Jesus looks back at Peter and says, really? Because I can promise you that tonight, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you're going to deny me three times. So, it's later that night. How many times has Peter denied Jesus? Twice. So now Peter's getting agitated. Why? Because he's afraid. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to be arrested. He doesn't want to, want, want to be put on trial. He doesn't want to be crucified on the cross. So he goes to another place, and they follow him, and somebody says, no, I know you were with Jesus. And now Peter gets angry and says, no, I never even met the man. Was that a lie? Yes, that was a lie. Right then, the rooster crowed. And from where Peter was sitting, Jesus could see him. Peter looked right at Jesus, and Jesus looked right at Peter. And right then, Peter remembered what Jesus... How many times has Peter denied him now? Three times. How do you think Peter felt about that? I, I bet he felt pretty bad, right? Have you ever done anything... You don't have to answer this. Have you ever done anything that you shouldn't have done because you were afraid of getting in trouble? Like maybe you lied about something because you're, we've all done something like that, right? We all know how, know how, and when you realize you've done it, how do you feel? You feel kind of bad, a bit sad, right? It doesn't feel good to lie to the people that we care about. Well, the story's not over. So Jesus is going to be crucified. And then he's going to be placed in the tomb. And three days later, they're going to come to take care of and prepare Jesus' body for burial. But the tomb that is going to be empty, the stone is rolled away, and they get there, and Jesus is not there. And then Jesus begins to appear to them in different places, and they realize that Jesus has been raised from the dead, that we don't have to be afraid of death, we don't have to be afraid of dying, and our sins are forgiven. It's one of the best moments in all of human history. There's this day when, after Jesus has been resurrected, Jesus appears to the disciples. They're sitting around a fire, and Jesus says, Peter, I want to speak with you. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were Peter, I'd be thinking, oh, no, I know what we're going to talk about. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, do you love me? And what do you think Peter says? Of course I love you, Lord. And Jesus says, well, then feed my sheep. That's the first time. And then Jesus says again, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, of course I love you. You know I love you, Lord. And Jesus says, then feed my lambs. Now, do you think he's talking about sheep and lambs? No, he's talking about people. Then a third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Now, what do you think is happening? Jesus asked Peter if he loved him how many times? And how many times did Peter deny Jesus? So by now, Peter's figured out what Jesus is doing. And Peter's, and if I, I can just imagine if I were there, Peter just kind of, sinking a little bit when he realizes what Jesus is doing and says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. It's in that moment when Peter knows that he's been forgiven and that there is no, there's been no point in that whole period of time when Jesus did not love him. So here's what I want you to remember as we go into Holy Week. Sometimes we do things that we're ashamed of. The scriptures say that's going to happen. Sometimes we do things that hurt, hurt other people's feelings, and sometimes we do things that make God's heart sad. But there is never a point 
when God does not love us. And there will never be a time when God is not willing to forgive us and take us back. So the next time you feel bad, because you may have lied about something that you really felt bad about lying about, I want you to remember that there's never a time when God is not ready to forgive us. Can you remember that this week? All right. Let's pray together. And at the end of the prayer, I'm going to say, and all the people said, and I want you to join me and say amen as loud as you can. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful for what you did when you walked the earth 2,000 years ago, and we're also grateful, Lord, for what you are doing today. Thank you for loving us, even when we do things that we are not proud of. And thank you for being willing to forgive us and being willing to accept us and embrace us when we are ready to come home to you. Help us to remember that no matter where we are or no matter what we've done, you're always ready to forgive us. And all the people said? All right, I think Mrs. Schultz is ready to take you to Children's Church. Thank you for coming this morning. As the kiddos are working their way to the back of the sanctuary, I want to I want to give you an option. It is traditional to stand during the reading of the gospel lesson. Um, that's something that's been done in the church for a very long time. But this is a very lengthy reading. And so you have the option. You may stand if you would like, or you also may be seated, and you're more than welcome to bow if you would like to do so. Today is called Passion and Palm Sunday because as we take a look at this story, we don't just take a look at the part of the story that talks about when Jesus entered Jerusalem. As we prepare our hearts for what is Holy Week, we begin that journey by taking a look at the story of the Passion of Christ. Let's read that together. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. When the time came, Jesus took his place at the table, and the apostles joined him. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I tell you, I won't eat it again until it is fulfilled in God's kingdom. After taking a cup and giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. I tell you that from now on, I won't drink from the fruit of the vine until God's kingdom has come. After taking the bread and giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the meal and said, This cup is the new covenant by my blood, which is poured out for you. But look, my betrayer is with me. His hand is on this table. The human one goes just as it has been determined. How terrible it is for that person who betrays him. They began to argue among themselves about which of them it could possibly be who would do this. The argument broke out among the disciples over which one of them should be regarded as the greatest. But Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles rule over their subjects and those in authority over them are called friends of the people. But that's not the way it will be with you. Instead, the greatest among you must become like a person of lower status and the leader like a servant. So which one is greater, the one who is seated at the table or the one who serves at the table? Isn't it the one who is seated at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are the ones who have continued with me in my trials, and I confer royal power on you just as my father granted royal power to me. Thus, you will eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you will sit on thrones overseeing the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, look, Satan has asserted the right to sift you all like wheat. However, I have prayed for you that your faith won't fail. When you have returned, strengthen your brothers and sisters. Peter responded, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus replied, I tell you, Peter, the rooster won't crow today before you've denied me three times, denied three times that you know me. Jesus said to them, when I sent you out without a wallet, bag, or sandals, you didn't lack anything, did you? They said nothing. Then he said to them, but now, whoever has a wallet must take it and likewise a bag. 
And those who don't own a sword must sell their clothes and buy one. I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in relation to me. And he was counted among criminals. Indeed, what's written about me is nearing completion. They said to him, Lord, look, here are two swords. He replied, enough of that. Jesus left and made his way to the Mount of Olives, as was his custom, and the disciples followed him. When he arrived, he said to them, pray that you won't give in to temptation. He withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed. He said, Father, if it is your will, take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not my will, but your will must be done. Then a heavenly angel appeared to him and strengthened him. He was in anguish and prayed even more earnestly. His sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. When he got up from praying, he went to the disciples. He found them asleep, overcome by grief. He said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you won't give in to temptation. While Jesus was still speaking, a crowd appeared and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the human one with a kiss? When those around him recognized what was about to happen, they said, Lord, should we fight with our swords? And one of them struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Jesus responded, stop, no more of this. He touched the slave's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come to get him, have you come with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a thief? Day after day, I was with you in the temple, but you didn't arrest me. But this is your time when darkness rules. After they arrested Jesus, they led him away and brought him to the high priest's house. Peter followed from a distance. When they lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant woman saw him sitting in the firelight. She stared at him and said, this man was with him too. But Peter denied it, saying, woman, I don't know him. A little while later, someone else saw him and said, you are one of them too. But Peter said, man, I am not. An hour or so later, someone else insisted. This man must have been with him because he's a Galilean too. And Peter responded, man, I don't know what you're talking about. At that very moment, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the Lord's words. Before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Peter went out and cried uncontrollably. The men who were holding Jesus in custody taunted him while they beat him. They blindfolded him and asked him repeatedly, prophesy, who hit you? Insulting him, they said many other horrible things against him. As morning came, the elders of the people, both chief priests and legal experts, came together, and Jesus was brought before their council. They said, if you are the Christ, tell us. He answered, if I tell you, you won't believe. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer. But from now on, the human one will be seated on the right side of the power of God. They all said, are you God's son then? He replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need further testimony? We've heard it from his own lips. The whole assembly got up and led Jesus to Pilate and began to accuse him. They said, we found this man misleading our people, opposing the payment of taxes to Caesar and claiming that he is the Christ, a king. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, that's what you say. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no legal basis for action against this man, but they objected strenuously, saying, he agitates the people with his teaching throughout Judea, starting from Galilee all the way here. Hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was from Herod's district, Pilate sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. Herod was very glad to see Jesus, for he had heard about Jesus and wanted to see him for quite some time. He was hoping to see Jesus perform some sign. Herod questioned Jesus at length, but Jesus didn't respond to him. The chief priests and the legal experts were there, fiercely accusing Jesus. Herod and his soldiers treated Jesus with contempt. Herod mocked him by dressing Jesus in elegant clothes and sending him back to Pilate. Pilate and Herod became friends with each other that day. Before this, they had been enemies. Then... 
Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people. He said to them, you brought this man before me as one who was misleading the people. I have questioned him in your presence and found nothing in this man's conduct that provides a legal basis for the charges you have brought against him. Neither did Herod, because Herod returned him to us. He's done nothing that deserves death. Therefore, I'll have him whipped, then let him go. But with one voice they shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison because of a riot that had occurred in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them again because he wanted to release Jesus. They kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time, Pilate said to them, why? What wrong has he done? I found no legal basis for the death penalty in this case. Therefore, I will have him whipped and then let him go. But they were adamant, shouting their demand that Jesus be crucified. Their voices won out. Pilate issued his decision to grant their request. He released the one they asked for who had been thrown into the prison because of a riot and murder, but he handed Jesus over to their will. As they led Jesus away, they grabbed Simon, a man from Cyrene, who was coming in from the countryside. They put the cross on his back and made him carry it behind Jesus. A huge crowd of people followed Jesus, including women who were mourning and wailing for him. Jesus turned to the women and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't cry for me. Rather, cry for yourselves and your children. The time will come when they will say, Happy are those who are, who are unable to become pregnant, the wombs that never gave birth, and the breasts, the breasts that never nursed a child. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. If they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? They also led two other criminals to be executed with Jesus. When they arrived at the place called the Skull, they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They drew lots as a way of dividing up his clothing. The people were standing around watching, but the leaders sneered at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he really is the Christ sent from God, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, If you really are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Above his head was a notice of the formal charge against him. It read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging next to Jesus insulted him, Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Responding, the other criminal spoke harshly to him, Don't you fear God, seeing that you've also been sentenced to die? We are rightly condemned, for we are receiving the appropriate sentence for what we did, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, I assure you that today you'll be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness covered the whole earth until about three o'clock, while the sun stopped shining. Then the curtain in the sanctuary tore down the middle. Crying out in a loud voice, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I entrust my life. After he said this, he breathed for his last time. When the centurion saw what happened, he praised God, saying, It's really true. This man was righteous. All the crowds who had come together to see this event returned to their homes, beating their chests after seeing what had happened. And everyone who knew him, including the woman who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance observing these things. Now there was a man named Joseph who was a member of the council. He was a good and righteous man. He had not agreed with the plan and actions of the council. He was from the Jewish city of Arimathea and eagerly anticipated God's kingdom. This man went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Taking it down, he wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid it in a tomb carved out of the rock in which no one had ever been buried. It was the preparation day for the Sabbath, and the Sabbath was quickly approaching. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph. They saw the tomb and how Jesus' body, Jesus body was laid in it. Then they went away and prepared fragrant spices and perfumed oils. They rested on the Sabbath in keeping with the commandment. Jesus is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
there was this um, swimming pool that I had. It was a little, one of those little round plastic pools. And I was thinking about this on the day when I came home from PT, that's physical training in the Army, and I found uh, leading back from my kitchen to the girls' bedroom a series of breadcrumbs. I always thought that was a thing for fairy tales, but I walked in the door and early in the morning there was a series of breadcrumbs. And so I walked, followed these breadcrumbs back into my daughter's room. Now at this time, Robin and Samantha were both, what, Kate, probably four years old, maybe if that, four or five years old. I walked into the door, uh, opened up and walked into the room and they were sitting against the wall underneath the window and uh, Robin had a loaf of bread in her hands that she was reaching into, breadcrumbs everywhere. Samantha, um, Samantha is a party looking for a place to happen. Um, and so Samantha was not going to settle for bread. Samantha got the chocolate frosting out of the refrigerator. And so Samantha was sitting there with chocolate frosting all over her face and her hands and the carpet around her. And I looked at them both and I said, did you all get into the food this morning? And they looked at me as innocent little angels and just shook their heads no. And then immediately in that moment, I was taken back to my childhood in the little pool. I had this pool. It was plastic. It was outside uh, on our patio in Topeka, Kansas, where my dad was appointed when I was very young. I was probably in kindergarten at the time, and I had been playing with one of my Tonka trucks outside. Uh, this Tonka trunk was a little front loader that had a handle on it, and you could drive it and you know push the front loader down. It would pick things up. Well, I've been playing with this, and I, I don't know what possessed me to do this, but I thought that uh, it would be great fun to drive that Tonka truck through the pool. Now, given that I am a, a preacher's kid with an overdeveloped sense of morality, I couldn't do this without asking permission. So I went to the door of the house. Uh, it was almost time to come inside for the night. And I opened the screen door and yelled for mom. And she asked me what I wanted. And I asked her if I could play in the pool. She said no. I shut the door, went back out with my overdeveloped sense of morality, took my Tonka truck, and drove it through the pool. And then that was so much fun, I drove it back through the pool. And I did that several times. Now, you're thinking to yourself, is this one of those pools that's kind of the soft plastic that fills up as you put water in it? Or is it one of those hard molded plastic pools? It was the hard molded type. So when I hit this full speed with my Tonka front loader, it broke. And so I'm driving through. By the time I get done driving through this thing, there's no water. The pool's broken. Mom comes out to call me inside, looks at me and says, Matt, did you play? I'm like, I'm covered in water, right? Matt, did you play in the pool? No, ma'am. I would never disobey you like that. I like these stories because I have been Peter. And so have you. Those moments when I have been afraid that I was going to get in trouble. Remember so many, of, I could tell you so many stories like that from my childhood, but if we're all being honest with one another, it's not those moments from our childhood that keep us up at night. It's the moments from our adulthood that we hope that nobody will ever know about that keep us awake. I've been Peter, and so have you. And you know, just like I told the kids this morning, there will be that day that comes when Peter is reinstated. That passage of scripture that I told them about, that's normally called the reinstatement of Peter. Jesus sits down and asks Peter if he loves him this three times. And, and I can just see Peter sitting there excited to see Jesus. All of this has happened. They've been so afraid. They've been so scared. They've, they've been in awe and wonder of the power of God at the empty tomb. And now here is Jesus sitting with them, resurrected. Peter probably can't wait. And then in this moment, Jesus wants to talk to Peter. And when he begins to, I can just see Peter figuring out what this is about. That burden that he's been carrying on his soul. Jesus will reinstate him. Jesus will let Peter know that this great love has always been there. That great love was there the moment that Peter denied Jesus for the third time and the rooster crowed and Jesus looked at Peter. Can you imagine that? Oh my gosh. What would have happened if in that moment when mom came out and said, Matt, did you play in the pool? And I said, no, mom. Can you imagine if Jesus had been there and looked straight in your eyes? 
What about that moment when you lied to the person you cared about the most? They still don't know about it. What about that moment when you lied to someone that you care about very much and they're not even here anymore because they've passed on to the church triumphant. They're worshiping God eternally around God's throne. And at some point, you've thought to yourself, they're in heaven now. They know. Quietly somewhere you've said to yourself, you've said to God, I'm sorry. There's so much about this story to talk about. And, and next week, we're going to spend so much time on the resurrection and the crucifixion. The reinstatement of Peter is powerful because it, it tells us a few things. It tells us that God is there, that God is ready, that God is willing, and that even when we do something as shameful as denying Christ, God will still welcome us home. God will still transform us. And God will still use us. The keys to the church are given to Peter. But it's that thief on the cross. It's that thief on the cross, not the one who's angry. That, one, that thief is frustrating. I, I like, uh, for, for a while I was into this kick where I like to watch old westerns, right? I always liked old westerns because of the word comeuppance. I know that comeuppance is not a word. I still think that comeuppance is one of the greatest words in the English language. The reason I like Westerns is because the bad guys, I mean, you know who the bad guys are, right? The bad guys are clearly bad, and the good guys are clearly good, and you know that at some point before the end of the Western, the bad guys will get their comeuppance. I like Westerns because of comeuppance. I just think they're great. So this thief on the cross who's so, who's so mean to Jesus, we want that thief to get his comeuppance. I have to believe that if God can forgive Peter and God can forgive me, maybe God can also forgive that thief. But it's the other one. It's the other one who chastises the thief who spoke first and said, no, 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 you're wrong. See, we're here and we're getting the punishment we deserve. But this man next to us, man has not done anything and is up here being punished with us. And then he looks at Jesus and he is resigned. See, you and I have been Peter. I've been Peter. You've been Peter. But you and I have also been that thief on the cross. I know. That's what the thief is saying. I know, God. I know, Jesus. I don't deserve to be in your presence. I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve eternal life. I know that, and I know that because I know where I've been and what I've done. And guess what? I know, Jesus, that you know that too. So let's not lie to each other. Let's be honest. I don't deserve to be in your presence. And so that thief looks at Jesus and says, Would you just mind thinking about me from time to time when you get to where you're going? Just don't forget me. And it's in the very next moment when the heart of Jesus, the heart that has been shown throughout the earthly, earthly ministry of Christ, the heart that has been shown in the teachings of Christ, the heart of God that has been shown from day one of creation all the way to the crucifixion and will continue to be shown forevermore, it's in that moment that the heart of Christ is revealed. And Christ looks back at that thief and says, Brother, I won't need to remember you. Because today... You're going to be with me. You're coming where I am going. <clears throat> Jesus says to his, to his disciples, I'm going to go to a place where you can't come, but don't worry, I'm going to come back and get you. I'm going to take you to where I am. He's sitting there on the cross, and this thief is resigned. This thief is resigned because this thief is not entitled. Oh, that American culture could take the from that story today. This thief is not entitled. I'm not entitled to be with you, God. I'm not entitled to your forgiveness. I'm not entitled to your grace. I'm not entitled to heaven, and I'm not worthy of any of it. I know who I am, and I know what I've done, and I know that you know the same thing. Just please, if you wouldn't mind, remember me from time to time. And yet Jesus says, brother, all of this is for you. 
even if there hadn't been any other person on earth. This is what Jesus is saying in Jesus' earthly ministry and throughout the teaching and in Christ's actions on the cross. Jesus is saying this, this to the thief, this to you, and this to me. My friend, even if it had only been you, I would still have come up here. This is for you. God is not finished with you. God did not ever just have one thing that God wanted you to do. God did not ever just have one reason that God wanted to know you. There is not one thing that you did that caused God to love you, and there is not one thing you can do that will stop God from loving you. God is not finished with you yet. That is the story of the thief on the cross, and it is the story of Peter. It's not fashionable today to say things like the people of the church are perfect. It's not a part of our culture. And if we said that, uh, if, we said, hey, if somebody stood up and said, hey, we're perfect people, we'd all stay up, stand up and say, no, we're not. Everything that you just said is right. We know what we've done. We know who we, know who we have been, and we know that Christ knows what we've done and who we have been. We know that we are not worthy of the gift that we receive in Christ. We are not perfect. And so I was sitting in the congregation one day in Leawood, Kansas, when my father got up and said, the church is not full of sinners. And everybody woke up. And I remember having this moment. I was young, but I was still a preacher's kid, and so I understood church politics. And I remember thinking, Dad, you're about to get yourself in trouble. Where are you going with this? Dad said, the church is not full of sinners. The church is full of repentant sinners. People who are either seeking or know and are seeking the redemptive love of Christ. The church is full of sinners who are being transformed by the love of Christ. The church is full of sinners who are being forgiven by the love of Christ. The church is full of sinners who are being justified and sanctified by the love of Christ. You see, you and I have been Peter, and you and I have been the thief on the cross, and you and I are Peter today. God is not finished with you yet. Not one time, not once in the great story of the scripture does God choose a perfect, blameless person to carry the gospel into a hurting and broken world. The keys of the church are given to Peter. And Peter is told to take that church, the called out ones, the set apart ones, and go and transform the world with the love of God that will always be with them even till the very end of the age. You and I are still Peter. God is not so be forgiven. One of the great messages of the cross is to accept the freedom and power that God gives you to stop being harder on yourself than Christ is. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are redeemed. And in the name of Jesus Christ, you are even now being transformed. So step into your call. God is ready and waiting to do a new thing in you. Would you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Melt us and mold us and fill us and use us. The Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Holy and merciful God, we confess that we have not always taken upon ourselves the yoke of obedience, nor been willing to seek and to do your perfect will. We have not loved you with all our heart and mind and soul and strength, and neither have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. You have called to us in the need of our sisters and brothers, and we have passed unheeding on our way. In the pride of our hearts and our unwillingness to repent, we've turned away from the cross of Christ, and we have grieved your Holy Spirit.
This is the message we've heard from God and proclaim to you that God is light and in God there is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus the Son cleanses us from all sin. May Almighty God, who caused light to shine out of darkness, shine in our hearts, cleansing us from all our sins and restoring us to the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior. Amen. ends we give a portion a token you gave your son jesus you offered us forgiveness and redemption from a lifetime of self-absorption and disobedience he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross we dedicate these offerings to you the greatest of all givers unworthy servants but for your grace and boundless love in the name of him whose name is above every other name, in Christ we pray. Amen. All things come from you, O God, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. You created all that is, and with love formed us in your image. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. All that we are and all that we have is a trust from you. And so in gratitude for all your gifts... We offer you ourselves and all that we have in union with Christ's offering for us. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. 